The gut microbiome affects the health and function of many organ systems. Positive effects include a basic role in digestion, providing nutrients to the host, including vitamin production, and then degrading uh, foreign metabolites, which is known as xenobiotic degradation. Now, the gut microbiome also uh, impacts the immune system, immune system maturation and function. And then interestingly note, there's a picture of muscle there. So it also impacts the gut muscle axis. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I'll leave a link to that in the right corner. Uh, so positive effects for the gut microbiome also include brain development and behavior, and then protection and clearance from pathogen invasion. However, uh, the gut microbiome can negatively uh, affect us, including the obvious, which would be uh, intestinal related issues, including colon cancer development and gastrointestinal disorders. But then note, uh, there are extra intestinal, so outside of the in intestinal effects on health, including uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes and obesity, and it can contribute to chronic kidney disease. So with all of this in mind, uh, which gut bacteria are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk? And when we know that, with the goal of optimizing health and poten potentially longevity, how can we limit levels of those bacteria? So getting right into it, higher gut microbiome levels of enterobacteria CA, and I'll call them enterobacteria for short, uh, are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. And that's what we can see here. So uh, just to dissect this data, so we've got cause of death on the left, the number of deaths, the hazard ratio, and then the FDR, which is the false discovery rate as the measure of statistical significance. So first, when looking at all-cause mortality, we can see that relatively higher levels of enterobacteria are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So when looking at the data on the right for the hazard ratio, where the horizontal lines, which is the confidence interval, if they're both greater than one, uh, then that's a statistically significant effect, which is what we see here. Now, uh, obviously, because enterobacteria are located in the intestine, we can see an increased uh, uh, risk of death for gastrointestinal, or uh, yeah, an increased risk of death related to gastrointestinal issues uh, as shown there. But then also notice there's an, uh, an increase in cancer. So relatively higher levels of enter enterobacteria, higher risk of death from cancer. Now they didn't specify in the paper if that was gastrointestinal only cancer, but this is total cancer. And then interestingly, uh, and suggestive of a gut lung axis, uh, so higher levels of gut levels of enterobacteria were associated with an increased risk of death from respiratory related issues. And I also have a video related to that, uh, in, uh, more specifically pneumonia and uh, viral infection and the link between the gut microbiome for that. So if you're interested in that, I'll leave a link also in the right corner. Now, um, outcomes that were not associated with all-cause mortality risk in terms of uh, enterobacteria levels were uh, cardiovascular deaths, neurological deaths, and other. Now, as a double whammy here, not only are enterobacteria relatively higher levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, they increase during aging. And there weren't any pretty pictures to show from this, uh, from this study, so I just uh, you know, took a screenshot of the uh, main finding from this paper, and they found that enterobacteria were 1.7-fold higher in older adults that were about uh, an average age of 75 years when compared with uh, younger subjects, so 35 years. So the increase during aging and having higher levels, relatively higher levels, is associated with an all-cause mortality risk. So now that we know that, how can we limit gut microbiome levels of enterobacteria? So uh, as, as, I, as the title gives away the, uh, the uh, main point, enterobac enterobacteria levels are limited in, in the presence of short-chain fatty acids, SCFAs. So what are short-chain fatty acids? So uh, dietary fiber, and uh, dietary fiber is comprised of insoluble, which is uh, mostly not fermented by gut bacteria, and soluble fiber, which is uh, converted by gut microbiota or gut bacteria into the short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate, as shown there. Now, as the title says, enterobacteria levels are limited in the presence of SCFAs, so let's see that data. And that's, that's what's shown here, and there's a lot to unpack here, so I'm going to dissect it bit by bit so that we can all uh, have a proper understanding of it. So the um, young mice, uh, so these were about two months old, so that's very young for a mice, were treated with antibiotics and then colonized with three different bacterial species, Klebsiella pneumonia, pneumoniae, E. coli, uh, or Proteus mirabilis. And that's what the blue uh, circles, triangles, and diamonds are showing. So why did they pick these bacteria? So uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae and E. coli are enterobacteria. They're bacterial species in the enterobacteria family. And that's what's uh, shown here. So you can see that the family for both uh, the Klebsiella pneumoniae and E. coli are enterobacteria. So what about Proteus mirabilis? So you can see that the family is not enterobacteria, but 
they were previously classified as enterobacteria at the time of publication for the data on the previous slide. Uh, Proteus mirabilis uh, were enterobacteria, classified as enterobacteria, but that bacterial family uh, that the Proteus mirabilis are found in was reclassified to, uh, and I may butcher the name, but uh, Morgan, Morganella CA. So probably butchered the name, but anyway, so that's a sister family uh, that is closely, closely related to enterobacteria. So, okay, going back to our data here. So uh, as a metric of how much of, uh, of these enterobacteria were found in the mice after colonization, they looked at CF, CFU, which are colony, for, colony forming units per gram. And then they measured uh, levels of short chain fatty acids in the cecum. So I just want to take another side step here. So why the cecum? So the cecum is uh, the beginning of the large intestine and it's where the small intestine ends. So why, the, why did they pick uh, why did they look at short chain fatty acid content in the cecum versus other parts of the colon, the ascending colon, tra transverse colon, descending colon, the, the sigmoid colon, uh, and or the rectum. So the cecum contains the highest amounts of the short chain fatty acids in the large intestine. So just looking at, just looking at the small intestine, the jejunum and ileum, we can see that there are very low levels of short chain fatty acids, which is indic indicated on the y-axis. But uh, then when we look at the short chain fatty acid levels in the cecum, we can see relatively uh, high levels, or actually the highest levels on this on this chart, and then as we progress through the colon, we can see that the short chain fatty acid levels decrease as we go all the way through. So ascending to transverse, uh, the, the descending sigmoid colon, and then through the rectum, the short chain fatty acid levels decrease along each length relative to the levels in the cecum. So they were looking to maximize short chain fatty acid production because these are very hard. Uh, uh, short chain fatty acids to measure, they are metabolized very quickly. So you want to go after where they're found in the highest amounts, which is in the cecum. All right, so back to our data. So first we can see that those mice that were colonized with enterobacteria had, had uh, very high levels uh, or the highest levels of uh, um, uh, enterobacteria, you know, 10 to the 10th colony, for colony forming units per gram. All right, and then half of those, half of those mice were uh, divided into, well, the mice were divided into two groups. So one group was uh, then uh, force-fed uh, PBS, which is phosphate buffer, uh, buffered saline, which may have had the effect of washing away some of these bacteria. And also by doing that, it may have allowed for the growth of short chain fatty acid producing bacteria, because we can see that now there, there's, uh, there's a reduction in these uh, enterobacteria relative to the blue and short chain fatty acid levels are higher, almost, almost double. Now, the other half of those mice that were colonized with enterobacteria uh, initially were then force-fed or uh, gavaged uh, with uh, uh, feces. So the, uh, this is a fecal transplant, uh, uh, fecal microbiota transplant, FMT, uh, from, using feces from normal mice that were not treated with an antibiotics. And that effect uh, ended up reducing levels of the enterobacteria to almost close to the limit of detection, LOD. And then we can see all of the green uh, the circles, the triangles, and diamonds, we can see that short-chain fatty acid levels are now close to 30 and as high as 70 millimolar. So uh, also last but not least on this, on this uh, graph, uh, in, the, in these data, we can see a correlation. So that strong correlation of negative 0.81 is for the correlation between the levels of enterobacteria in the mice that were treated with uh, PBS or that had the fecal transplant versus short chain fatty acid levels. So what we can see is there's a strong inverse correlation. The higher the short chain fatty acid levels, the lower the levels of these enterobacteria. So just taking it back to the title of the slide, from that we can con conclude that enterobacteria levels are limited in the presence of short chain fatty acids. A and there's a caveat to this, but short chain fatty acid levels decrease during aging. And that's what's shown here, and this is human data. So when looking at four different age groups, younger than 50 years old, 50 to 65 years old, 66 to 80 years old, and older than 80, for each of the short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate, we can see at least or close to a 50% reduction looking at the youngest group, younger than 50, versus older than 80. So acetate, 49 millimolar to about 19 millimolar, so uh, more than 50% reduction. Propionate, 16 millimolar in the younger, youngest group to eight millimolar in the older than 80, so 50% reduction there. And then uh, approaching a 50% reduction for butyrate, the youngest versus the oldest group. And then the total short chain fatty acids, there's a clearly a uh, 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 more than half uh, 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 short chain fatty acid levels in the older adult, more older than 80 compared to the younger than 50 uh, year olds. So uh, aging, from this we can conclude that aging is characterized by lower levels of short chain fatty acids and higher enter enterobacteria. 
So with the goal of reducing enterobacteria and all-cause mortality risk, the main focus should be how can we increase short-chain fatty acid levels? Now, I've already gone through that, and a major reason, a major way to do that is by having a high soluble fiber diet. Uh, so that should maximize gut bacterial short-chain fatty acid production, and uh, that would then would be expected to potentially limit enterobacteria levels. Now, however, there are no randomized controlled trials, RCTs, in older adults that have tested this hypothesis. And, and if anybody's come across studies where uh, a high soluble fiber diet was given to older adults, so older than 60 years, and they looked at changes for short chain fatty acids or enterobacteria, please leave a comment in the, uh, in, in, you know, leave a comment below because I haven't come across it. So what about other interventions? Is, just, uh, is it just a high soluble fiber diet that can uh, affect short chain fatty acids and potentially enterobacteria and all cause mortality risk, or are there other interventions? So another way to increase short chain fatty acids is with exercise training. So in this study, and it's a relatively small study of 32 people uh, that were previously sedentary, so they were uh, relatively young, so 20 to 45 year olds, and this was a six week study that used three times a week of endurance exercise. Uh, and so they looked at before, uh, before training and after training, so E0 versus E6, and what we can see for each of these short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate, we can see significant increases for the circles, which were lean subjects that had a BMI less than 25. However, uh, uh, people that were obese in this study, so ha that had a BMI greater than 30, they did not see, exercise training did not impact short chain fatty acid levels. And that's potentially a topic for another video. Uh, the, actually, the why behind that, I mean, it's a big mystery uh, in, in the gut microbiome field. So uh, if anybody's got some ideas why that would be true or some papers, uh, please also leave a comment. Uh, you know, let's get a good discussion going around that. All right, so related to this, uh, you know, this, these data in terms of exercise training increasing short chain fatty acids, similarly, professional athletes, and in this case, it was uh, professional rugby players, uh, they have higher levels of fecal short chain fatty acids, so higher levels of the short chain fatty acids in poop versus non athletes. And we can see that for each of these short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate, the gray bars for the rugby players versus the non rugby players in green. So uh, with this in mind then, are there exercise training RCTs that have measured the effect on uh, short chain fatty acids and levels of enterobacteria in older adults, again, older than 60? And unfortunately, that there are no studies yet. I haven't come across any. Uh, a study was just recently published that they, they looked at uh, short chain fatty acid levels and exercise training, but this was in a, uh, a group that was approaching 60. But in terms of using exercise training uh, or even a high soluble fiber diet in people older than 60, as far as I know, there are no studies that have uh, investigated yet, especially with the goal of reducing enterobacteria levels. Uh, all right, that's all I've, all I've got for now. Uh, if you made it to the end, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. And as you can see on this slide, there are lots of ways to uh, find, uh, find me online. Uh, have a great day.